Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Uh, we got a little video here going up today on H. pylori. I'm excited to chat a little bit more about it. So we do a lot of H. pylori testing at the clinic and we test for H. pylori, typically the stool antigen and or the PCR DNA in the stool. And we'll also look at these virulence factors, right? Va uh, VACA, uh, OIPA, ISA, BABA, and these are virulence factors, which are essentially these uh, genetic cytotoxic proteins that are produced by the H. pylori. And these proteins can create inflammation. They can predispose uh, bacterial adhesion, inflammation, adenocarcinoma, which essentially stomach or gastric cancer, um, just overall ulcerations. So when we see H. pylori, the more we see these type of like CAGA or VACA virulence factors, it tells us that that H. pylori is more likely to create more problems and create more inflammation. So it's nice to know that. Now, when we test for H. pylori, whether it's in a genetic test or a stool antigen test, we don't necessarily have to have these virulence factors present for us to know that there's a problem. I've seen a lot of patients without virulence factors and have still had problems. And as we've resolved the H. pylori and we fixed the digestion, they started to feel better. One of the big issues with H. pylori is it produces LPS or lipopolysaccharide which is inflammatory and can create gut permeability, can open up those tight junctions, can allow food and bacteria into the bloodstream and can allow more immune stress and inflammation. H. pylori is notorious for secreting ammonia or urease, which then takes protein metabolism, spits out ammonia, it's got a pH of about 11. So it's alkalizing the gut, decreasing stomach acid. So your gut's going to be less acidic, more alkaline. So it's going to be harder to break down proteins and get your enzymes activated, get your, um, your acids and your bile salts going as well. So H. pylori can create those problems as well. And we know that they can stress out the immune system is a strong association with H. pylori and autoimmune thyroid issues. We know that they've done studies in Italy, for instance, where two groups that H. pylori, one got an antibiotic for it, killed it, one got a placebo, and they tested these people's antibodies because they all, they both had, both groups had Hashimoto's, and the group that had the antibiotic treatment that knocked out the H. pylori saw a significant reduction in their antibodies. So we know there's an association between Hashimoto's and thyroiditis, or I'm sorry, Hashimoto thyroiditis and H. pylori. So it is a big immune stressor. And that's just one autoimmune condition. There could be others. I know blast, though, there's a connection with that as well as Lyme and Yersinia. So H. pylori is, is definitely going to be a stressor on your gut. And it's going to be something we want to make sure we work on addressing and, and knock out, for instance. All right, any questions here? I'll let um, a couple people kind of chime in here. Let's see what's going on. All right, Nora writes in, hey, Nora, I hope you're doing well. Let me bring your chat over here. You had me on DHEA adrenal support for about a year. My recent Dutch chest, so super high DHEA and 5-alpha reductase enzyme potent testosterone, which caused bad jaw cystic acne. I've been off the DHEA, but the acne is still bad. Um, what to do to reverse DHEA effects? So DHEA, we give small amounts of DHEA. And even if someone has adequate levels of DHEA, um, we, tip, we typically would still give it anyway because when we have a lot of adrenal stress, mm -hmm. cortisol is abnormally high or low, it's going to be a big support for the adrenals, number one. Number two, the biggest driving factor of acne is going to be high levels of insulin. So getting insulin levels under control is going to be big because high levels of insulin are going to um, – are going to drive this enzyme called 1720 lyase, which will cause more androgens to increase. So that can drive more acne because more androgens will create more sebum, and then that feeds the bacteria on the skin. Now, estrogen issues can easily cause skin issues. So sometimes we'll give higher dose vitamin A to shrink some of those um, sebum glands, and we'll even give black currant seed oil to help modulate some of the prostaglandin one and three, which can drive acne. So it just depends on the root cause. Nor I don't have your file or labs in front of me. But one of the first things I would do is make sure insulin's good, make sure estrogen dominance is good, and then I would probably throw in some vitamin A and black currant seed oil. Dennis, how much calculus do chiropractors learn? Great question. I had to take calculus one and two in school. So I forgot most of it because it's not that applicable now, but I had to take a full two years of it. Uh, K. Gupta writes in, in your line, which products do you recommend for SIBO and H. pylori? So we just talked about here looking at the virulence factors. We want to knock those out. And I've seen them change as we knock the H. pylori down. That cytotoxic gene protein expression can change. So 
We use masticum and clove and high dose berberines are the big ones that I'm going to use for H. pylori. Now, sometimes there's other infections beyond H. pylori, but we have to make sure that that's that other things are addressed as well. So there could be fungus, there could be a, a parasite, there could be another type of C. diff or something like that, or SIBO. So you have to make sure you look at it all together. Yeah, Nora, you're totally welcome. Uh, regarding acne, there's lots of different potential causes and yours may not have been caused by the DHEA, more than likely not. But I look forward to connecting to diving in a little deeper with you on that. K. Gupta writes in, can you please explain your 5-hour program? Which steps do you concurrently do in a series? So the first hour is removing the bad foods. This is foundational, right? Getting the anti-inflammatory, nutrient-dense, low-toxin foods in there, right? Pulling out the bad stuff. Number two is being able to digest it because if we don't have enough enzymes or acids or bile salts to break it down, the foods in a ferment, putrefy, or incentivize, it's going to rot, essentially. Third is going to be repairing the gut lining and or repairing the hormones. So we're trying to really help calm down the inflammation. Now, we don't do that with everyone because some people come in, they don't have a ton of gut inflammation. Some do, some don't. So if we have more gut inflammation, more pain or inflammation or more calprotectin on your gut test or issues with your IgA, we may give more nutrients to help that. More anti-inflammatory compounds, like glutamine, DGL, licorice, we may of course, work on supporting the hormones. If there's hormonal stress, hormones have an incredible anti-inflammatory role, so we may want to add in more hormonal support to balance that. Number four is removing the infections. Number five is repopulating, re-inoculating good, healthy bacteria. Six is retest. The first three hours are typically always going to be done, um, you know, are going to be done like the whole time, and then we cycle the fourth and fifth and sixth hour and accordingly. Hope that helps. K to space where I say ingredients, Dr. J, are there any mechanisms that can cause a numbness and burning and stinging sensation on the skin that sits just below the spine and right behind the scapula? Does it, does it follow, that doesn't follow an injury? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. That's a really tough question. I'd have to examine that area. So there's numbness, there's burning, and it's on the skin and it sits just below the spine on the right. So, I mean, I would want, I'd think there'd be some type of disc issue personally, some type of disc impingement. Maybe it's a postural thing and that disc is bulging out, maybe not fully herniated, but bulging out and, and hitting um, the nerve root in that area. That's my gut intuition on that one. But again, you can look at doing decompression or just imp posture improvements and see if that changes anything. All right, Sin, what do you recommend as a replacement for organic half and half if you drink a cup of coffee in the morning? I've tried almond and coconut cream, but it messes with the coffee taste. Yeah, so what I do is collagen and MCT oil. It gives that nice kind of creamy kind of vibe. You can e easily just do coffee, um, sorry, butter and MCT in your coffee. But butter, MCT, and collagen is what I do, and it's phenomenal. The Corvac rice then is apple cider vinegar good for digesting and bloating. Yeah, it is. Apple cider vinegar is acetic acid. It's got a pH of about two and a half. So it helps bring that pH down, which increases the acidity, right? Acidity is low pH, which helps with digestion and gets the enzymes going. Elizabeth writes in, is multiple sclerosis reversible? Yes. Go read Terry Walls' book, The Walls Protocol, or Minding Your Mitochondria. She was wheelchair ridden with MS and now is totally able to walk and is functional. So yes, MS can be reversed. MO writes in, hello from Kuwait. My goal is to travel to some countries of the world and the nature and the tourist attractions have joined the channel. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Mo. Appreciate it. K. Gupta writes in, what's your take on eating lemon peel for detoxification and other benefits? I mean, you're going to get citric acid in the lemon peel, which, I mean, there's some general generalized effects there, but it's not going to help detoxify you. It's not like a B vitamin. It's not like a sulfur amino acid where it's an upregulate glutathione, but there's probably some benefits on the citric acid side, probably more with digestion, I'm going to guess. And then there's delimining in there, which helps with digestion. So probably more something more the detoxification benefits are coming from better digestion, not from supporting detoxification directly. That's my best guess on that. What coffee brand do you suggest? Well, there's all kinds of good coffee brands out there. I mean, you have Bulletproof. Um, right now, I am doing Kicking Horse Coffee, and I do the Kicking Horse Smart Ass Coffee. That's the one I do. It's a medium blend. I like it. I do that every morning, and I do that with MCT oil, butter, and collagen. And I do a little bit of vanilla extract, too. Do you believe rosacea is gut related? Yes, it is. Um, just type in rosacea and autoimmune. There's an autoimmune connection. I had lots of rosacea when I was younger and I was able to fix it 
with getting my gut clean and getting my um, diet clean too. Dennis writes in, what would cause frequent urination? My A1C is at five and a half. A1C at five and a half is fine. Um, the first thing I do is I go to, are you drinking too much water? Um, is there issues with your insulin and you too much carbs? All those are possible. So I'd want to look a little bit deeper at those things to see if there's a, a connection at all. Oh, you're welcome, Susan. I appreciate it. My opinion on LDN, uh, it's hit or miss. I've seen a lot of patients that have done it and it's not really provided a great benefit. And I've seen a few that are like, hey, it really helped me. Most no benefits, a couple, it made them worse, small amount, it helped. So it's my clinical opinion, eh, it's hit or miss. If you have some severe autoimmune stuff, give it a try, but I don't put a ton of stock into it. All right, any last questions, guys, let me know. So today we kind of opened the talk on H. pylori. That was the topic of the day. I think, and we talked about some of the virulence factors, which are these kind of genetic cytotoxic proteins being produced. VACA and CAGA are the big ones and that can increase chances of ulcerations and gut inflammation. Those are the big kind of topic of the day. So feel free, smash that like button, hit the subscribe, put your comments below. We're trying to get some of the, the tech, I was doing a lot of different tests during the day. I need to get new software to go live because YouTube is changing over their hangouts on the air. It's gone, they're like, they're getting rid of the software that allows me to chat with you all now. So I have to use third party software that integrates. And because I do a lot of live podcasts with other doctors, um, it's hard to have a software that does that, right? Because that software doesn't allow that. So I'm just having to do a lot more research. So if you see me doing little test stuff, I'm trying to get this dialed in so I can come back to you guys um, and still have these conversations, which I love to do. Uh, K to space. Yep, I heard you there. I'm going to think about this stuff. That's going to be the big thing is, is this stuff. Um, it could even be potential gallbladder if disc isn't an issue, but I would look at disc and gallbladder as a viscerosomatic reflux because that does connect to the shoulder, right? Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscap, um, teres minor, the, that's your, your rotator cuff. So it's right in that rotator cuff scapula area. All right, guys, anything else? Let me know. If not, I will try to get some other videos put up this week and try to connect with you all as soon as I get the software stuff done. Comments below, hit the bell, and I appreciate it, guys. All right, you have a phenomenal night. We'll talk soon. Take care. Bye now.